Uh, feel free to turn off your cameras and, and mute. All right. Today's presentation is titled Every Texan Connected, Working with Covered Populations. I am joined today with a member of the ILSR team. I'm going to give him a chance to introduce himself before I move on to the agenda. Ryan, Brian, you would like to state your name, your purpose here today? Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Rai Marcatilio. I am the Associate Director for Research, working uh, on community broadband networks at ILSR. And I'll be talking about some telehealth uh, stuff in a little bit. Thank you, Rai. Next slide. We have a lot to go over today, so I'm going to try my best not to talk too fast, but just remember these slides, the clickable links that are in the slides are all going to be uploaded to the landing page along with a copy of this video. So even if you miss something, we're going to make this available and then you're going to get an email with a meeting recap with links to everything I just mentioned. So we just talked to Rai. Today we're going to go over the cover populations. I might refer to them as CPs, you know, to save space, but that's what I mean, cover populations, the three Ds, digital inclusion to digital opportunity. We're going to also go over um, some community design uh, solutions, like what do I mean by community code design solutions? What are those? What are some programs underway? Um, and then I'm going to share with you today um, some strategies that you could be um, implementing in your community if you haven't already, or just share some language about how to talk about uh, community coordination, community activation. And then Rai is going to walk through how to use the ILSR telehealth report and online calculator. And we will end the day with practical application, which is where we open it up for group discussion and any last Q&A session. Next slide. All right. So a huge part of the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan, the TDOP, has to do with cover populations. Throughout this presentation today, you will notice that we will see um, references to sections and page numbers. We're doing that for you because we understand that not everybody has um, a chance or the opportunity to read through really large documents like the TDOP. So we're hoping that this is a, a quick way for you to find the sections that are most relevant to your work. We want you to know that the a lot of the documentation and the reporting in the, T, in the TDOP was con conducted through a statewide planning process there were over 26 public engagement um, meetings and over, over 37 stakeholder groups um, across regions that were work with leaders or work with members of the covered populations um, in the document were involved. Next slide. So in the TDOP um, on page uh, 27, um, no, hold on, let me back up. Before we get to page 27, what we've done here is the first slide of where we've gone through the uh, to the TDOP plan and we pulled over into this table for you, the cover populations as they're described in the plan. And then you'll notice on the right side is the TDOP section. So to give you an example, if you look down at veterans, you'll notice over on the right is section three, page 64. So you'll be able to, if you download a copy of the Texas Digital Opportunity Plan and you're looking for cover populations, you'll go section three, this section of that section, page 64. And we have them all listed for you out here and you'll see how they're different. Next page. So what does that mean? Well, in Texas, which is the page 27 part I mentioned, there are over 24.8 million Texans and 86% of our state's population belongs to one or more cover population. In the TDOP, the plan also consider, considers the digital opportunity experiences of immigrants, members of indigenous communities, unhoused individuals, um, and others who are uniquely impacted by the digital divide. So it's a really large number. Next slide. In the covered populations section, page 27, you'll find a list of the covered populations and you'll also find the share of the Texas population. 
So again, to use veterans as an example, 5% a share of the Texas population are a cover population of veterans. If you go back up to the top, members of a racial or ethnic minority group, racial or ethnic minorities, 58% share of the Texas population. You can find this on page 27. Page 27 does not only include the information of the cover populations and these percentages, but there are tables and sightings and breakdowns of how these numbers were calculated. This is just, this screen cap of this is just to capture lots of information in these sections really quickly for you. Next slide. So as a reminder, we wanna go back over the three Ds so that we're all speaking the same um, language as it relates to the digital divide. I've got a map that we shared with you all last week, just to remind you all of the um, estimated percent percentage of the eligible households enrolled in ACP as a comparison. So the digital divide is the issue that we're working on. That's the problem. The problem is the digital divide. Digital inclusion is the work that we're doing to close the divide. And digital opportunity is the goal. So the plan really is about implementing solutions and strategies and achieving goals, which is why it's called the TDOP, the digital opportunity. So digital opportunity is the goal. Next slide. In the TDOP, there are five different goals, and each of the goals has a percentage of the cover populations that are impacted more or less by that, um, that issue as it relates to digital divide. So goal, if I use goal number one as an example, all Texans will have access to reliable, affordable internet service at home. The measurable outcome, NTIA measurable outcome, is broadband availability and affordability. So the measurable outcome is broadband availability and affordability. And so the goal is that all Texans will have um, affordable internet access. In Appendix B of the plan is where you will find the strategies, objectives, and baselines. And we've pulled out parts of information from each of these goals and measurable outcomes. So for example, if you wanted to know how many people in Texas that were rural residents or veterans or aging individuals that did not have broadband availability and affordability, those numbers are here. So that's why using veterans again as an example, 77% of veterans that are covered populations don't have broadband availability and affordability. Next slide. Device affordability and availability and technical support. So as you can see here, if we pull in again from Appendix B, these are the percentages of these cover populations that are most impacted by that measurable outcome. And the goal number two would be that all of these impacted populations would have the affordable access to the devices and the device that can connect to the internet. So you can see that even more cover populations with double digit numbers are impacted. Next slide. For digital literacy, it was individuals with limited English proficiency and unhoused. Again, it doesn't mean that there aren't other cover populations that are impacted by digital literacy. If you go back to the Appendix B that I keep referencing, that is also clickable in that um, first slide, you can go column by column to see the different percentages of the cover populations. I pulled these numbers from this column for you all today because they were quite high. And um, this is quite a trend we see across geographies, whether you're living in a rural or urban community, it's these numbers are um, tend to be the same, uh, higher. Next slide. This is still kind of a new topic for some as it relates to doing digital inclusion work is the topic of online privacy and cybersecurity. But Texas is one of the states that has online privacy and cybersecurity as part of our goals. Um, and 
in our measurable outcomes and in our plan. It is a large topic. It could do its own, um, it could have its own presentation. But I thought that this was really interesting that uh, individuals with limited English proficiency were one of the higher covered populations. And then you'll see that it, then after that low income and unhoused individuals. So these, to use a term that maybe might more be familiar, might be more familiar for those who work in nonprofit or do um, this side of sort of work, is that these are the um, the vulnerable households and individuals that are most affected. Next slide. And then the fifth measurable outcome and goal is online accessibility and inclusivity of public resources. And so for this section, you know, how many individuals belonging to a covered population never use the internet to look or apply for a job? I pulled this one specifically because I thought that was interesting because a lot of the solutions that our communities are working on relate to workforce development and telehealth uh, jobs specifically. So I thought this is a really high number in covered populations that are not using the internet to look for a job. Next slide. So what sort of programs are uh, underway or being planned? I mean, this is not, uh, this does not include the array of solutions out in our communities in Texas. I just wanted to share a few as they relate to uh, cover populations that, um, that are some solutions that are doing quite well or underway or you know some that y'all can study or look up if you're looking for examples. All of these examples are in Texas. Uh, OATS from AARP and OASIS is does all three. They provide devices, they connect older adults to affordable or no cost internet um, connectivity programs. They have a program called Aging Connected that really focuses on that. And they also uh, focus on racial and ethnic minor minorities and people with disabilities. Um, there's another program called HACA, um, Unlocking the Connected Initiative. It deals with working with uh, people that live in low-income households, such as public housing, to be specific. These links are clickable, so if you click on these links, it'll take you to more information about the program, um, and you can find out what's going on with them. And then another one uh, in Houston work specifically with veterans, racial and ethnic minorities, and people with disabilities. Next slide. Uh, there's a project in San Antonio, there's a program in San Antonio called Neighborhood Place Teen Tech Center, and it's working closely with low-income households. Specifically, they're working with uh, teenagers 12 to 18 years old and their families. And then one example that we're not going to go into detail about that much today is a, what we call a hybrid model. So there's a hybrid model in the city of Far that is working with these covered populations, but is not only providing uh, the three legs of the stool, the devices, the skills program, and um, the connectivity program, They're, they created a connectivity program for their residents. That's why it's a hybrid. The other programs that I listed are connecting their constituents or their customers to connectivity programs that exist. And CFR has a hybrid where they're creating those connectivity programs or connecting them to the affordable connectivity programs in their community. Uh, highly recommend looking that up to learn more. Next slide. So as of my broken record to you all, as I always am, now is the time to prepare if you're not already working on a plan or some sort of strategy connected to a plan in your community. So this is a reminder about what BDO anticipates funding. And you'll see uh, funding local partners, statewide organizations, and promoting internet adoption is there. So these all three are timely goals for funding as it relates to um, our communities and as we've just received the news of the ACP wind down. Next slide. What comes next? The public comment period ended January 5th, and now the BDO will develop a capacity grant program to fund and empower aligned organizations across the state of Texas when that plan has been completed, incorporating public comment. 
So spring of 2024 will be the approval of the plan. Summer of 2024 is when we anticipate the com um, competitive grant program to be developed. And then the grant applications are anticipated to open in fall of 2024. Next slide. I've created this 100-day digital opportunity planning model. If your community doesn't know where to start, here are some uh, some goals that you should be thinking about, or here are some like to dos that you should be putting you know into practice right now. Uh, coordinating grant applications and sharing technical writing resources. What that means is you might have low capacity or high capacity organizations that don't have uh, staff to write grants or they don't have the resources to write grants to so, so be considering if there's an, a ways that you could be sharing that sort of technical assistance in your local community. Uh, in March of 2024, the BDO hopes to release an online interactive version of the TDOP. And you will also be able to uh, access the an asset inventory. An asset inventory is where the research of organizations that are working on uh, device deployment, digital skills, or connectivity programs can be found. Some communities create their own asset inventory, and some uh, the state will uh, take the asset inventory that they've created and make it available. And that will serve as a resource hub to find organizations. So when that resource hub is available, that tool is available, you can go online. And if, for example, if you are in Upper Rio Grande Valley, and which is frontier rural, and people are far away from each other, and you're not sure if there are or not organizations that um, that can partner with you, or that you should be working with in your region. Uh, you can use that resource to see if they've been documented um, in the uh, interactive version of the inventory research hub. I've also linked to a cute example. Um, I would say that like communities that are working on their projects digital opportunity plans and projects should not be dependent on thinking that like 100% of all funding budgeted or forecasted for their project will be funded um, by the Texas Broadband Office. There are also other opportunities um, out in communities that are um, spearheaded by um, the financial banking institution space, uh, the the, the um, healthcare space, and also uh, this is an example of a nonprofit. Uh, Foundation AARP Foundation has a community challenge that's available um, it's an excellent opportunity to use this challenge to pull together your project for planning to see if you could apply for some of these other opportunities that can support your solutions uh, that are providing funding for uh, digital inclusion projects. And the, the AARP Community Challenge is one. Next slide. Uh, there's a saying that says you, you should never take a picture of someone taking a picture. So I hope you all appreciate the, the levity today that I uh, created a slide of a slide um, <laughs> because I wanted to remind you of the, the concepts that can be funded by the TDOP capacity grants that I shared last week. But in, in this 100 day challenge, you should be proposing a set of goals that um, include but are not limited to broadband infrastructure adoption, meaning helping uh, constituents and customers in your community um, connect to the broadband infrastructure that is available or that is being planned. You want data transparency related to broadband access and uh, meaning that like if there is information that's not getting to the, the, the hard to reach communities that are still not connected, you want to be making sure that those communities know about the broadband access that's available. And then you want to always be improving upon the digital skills program availability and device deployment. Digital skills programs um, have to be updated. You know, they move with the speed of the community. Communities uh, will need one resource at one time and need another resource as another time. For example, when the ACP enrollment process began, there were not a lot of uh, digital skills curriculum that were available that actually showed communities in their language, whether it was English or Spanish or something else, how to actually apply. Those came, um, those trickled out afterwards and some communities put time and resources into creating those. And also device deployment, wow, device deployment, um, you know, they have um, they have a shelf life. Some devices need to be updated and it, um, we'll talk more about device deployment next week. Next slide. 
while you're engaging in this process where your community preparing for uh, writing grants together, building projects and solutions together, one of the biggest challenges that we've talked about in previous presentations is addressing the roles and responsibilities within your community um, around this work. Some, some organizations have dedicated staff to coordinate and do this work and some do not. Uh, so you're gonna have to ensure that like in order to get your project across the goal or get it submitted you know, by its deadline and for it to meet its um, guidelines, you wanna make sure you address the role in your community. Like who is gonna help you coordinate? Can you dedicate um, people or organizations? Um, another way to be resourceful is making sure that you share what you already know about publicly owned access um, assets in your community. So you're not uh, building upon something that already exists. And you also, because information and data-driven solutions are key to all of the design, designs out there for these models, you want to be making sure you're sharing information among community members. I'm pointing to the Affordable Connectivity Program because this is an example where that coordination can take place right now and help um, support building out your ecosystem while the ACP is winding down, bringing people together to talk about life beyond ACPs. So it's all an excellent opportunity to get going on these uh, digital um, opportunity planning. All right, I'm gonna take a pause and I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Ryan. Thank you, Deanne, appreciate it. Uh, so as I said at the beginning, my name is Rai Marcatilio. I'm uh, the Associate Director for Research uh, doing broadband stuff at, uh, at ILSR. And I'll be talking a little bit today about a report that we did uh, that looked at how we could leverage telehealth savings uh, to build new broadband infrastructure or justify the, build, the building of new broadband infrastructure, which of course has the host of benefits that we all know about when it comes to connecting every household to fast and affordable broadband. So we started out with a pretty simple premise, which is that broadband infrastructure is expensive to build, but in policy spaces and the current broadband marketplace, there are so many communities, including communities of color, uh, that have historically and continue to lose out and be underinvested in. And yet, compared to what we spend on healthcare in this country, broadband infrastructure is a drop in the bucket. And so the question is, uh, can the telehealth savings that are that is out there justify or help justify the cost of building future-proof broadband to every household that's missing. So in this report, we looked at 10 rural counties across Mississippi and Alabama and Georgia. It's about 235,000 people or so representing rough annual healthcare spending of about $3 billion. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the need, in two of the counties in the report, not a single household had access to what we would consider in this room to be basic broadband service. Uh, similarly, about one in five households across all 10 counties both bring in less than 25,000 a year in income and do not have health insurance. And so there was a need. And then the report asks, are there savings to be had out there? Uh, generally speaking, telehealth delivery facilitates savings in one of two ways, uh, increased efficiency uh, or completely avoided costs. And so one of the things that we did when we started out writing this report is we looked at the scholarly literature that was out there and what they suggested were the potential savings that we could get from telehealth. And then we looked at the hospital system pilot programs that were actually out there and what they were seeing in terms of the savings uh, to those hospitals. Whenever there was more than one consensus value for the potential savings, we always took the lowest number. And so I think that's one of the benefits of this report is you're seeing what are the most conservative numbers that both scholars and hospitals think good telehealth programs um, could save. So to give you a sense of just the potential that's out there, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services has these well-established, pre-calculated, preventable hospital admissions rates already. Um, they range anywhere from 55 to 10% of all hospital admissions. In the report here, we uh, calculated saving just 10% of those already identified preventable admissions. Uh, similarly speaking, um, when we look at something like readmissions, something like 30 to 50% of all heart failure patients end up getting readmitted to the hospital 
within 30 days of having surgery. It's the largest contributor of hospital readmissions nationwide. Uh, but pilot programs that are out there have shown that as many as 75% of those readmissions could be avoided with a good telehealth program. We're talking about distributing devices with some sort of con connectivity, preloaded tablets with care plans, regular check-ins via video with your, with your care team, um, that kind of thing. Again, in this report, we're looking at just 10% of those costs avoidable from telehealth. Uh, next slide, please. So ultimately, we landed on five high impact areas where the industry agrees that telehealth can save money. These are hospital admissions and readmissions, uh, emergency department visits, which are fantastically expensive, the most expensive way uh, to deliver that healthcare is delivered in this country, uh, lost productivity because of illness, and then driving costs, how much you know it costs to drive your car, um, you know, 30 or 40 or 60 miles to the nearest hospital. Remember, one of the, the things going on here is uh, especially in rural parts of the country, both general clinics and specialty clinics are closing at a disproportionately high rate. And so folks who live in rural areas have to travel further and further uh, to get the care that they need. So, okay, after running the numbers based on existing hospital use and reported days of illness, we end up projecting in the report that robust telehealth delivered over reliable and universal and affordable broadband in these 10 counties uh, would have resulted in would result in savings of forty three million dollars each year across the ten counties. Forty three million dollars. That's uh, that's pretty huge. About half of that comes from lost productivity caused by illness, but thirteen million of it comes from avoided, completely avoided emergency part, department visits. Five and a half million from hospital readmissions, and just under two million from uh, from hospital admissions. Remember, we're only talking about uh, less than a quarter million people in this report. So when we translate those savings to larger areas, uh, the savings uh, go up. So we're looking at, uh, in this report, $850 million in total savings over 20 years, but we need infrastructure, right, to do the telehealth. There were 90,000 households in the report, 63,000 of those needed the infrastructure um, to support telehealth services. The good news is when we compare how much it costs to build broadband, to how much potential savings there are from telehealth, we found that the infrastructure would get paid for itself 10 times over with just the telehealth savings alone. And that's just the most conservative numbers that we applied to the situation. Of course, that does not include all the other benefits that come from having good, reliable broadband to your home, uh, remote education, remote work, um, micro businesses, uh, citizen engagement, uh, all that stuff. Next slide, please. So finishing up here, I want to talk about this last bit that we did with the report. So we wrote the report and put it out, but it occurred to us that folks might want to uh, take it and look at what was going on in their own communities. So I'm going to grab the screen share from Jordan here. All right, and you should be seeing the telehealth calculator as it exists right now. It, it lives at srbwihealthcalculator.com. Maybe uh, Deanne or somebody can grab the link there and throw it in the chat. Um, so it lets you basically do the math for your own county, however you like. All of the routes through which telehealth can deliver savings exist under this toggle variables button. Uh, it gets pre-populated when you go to the page uh, for one of the case study counties that we had in the report. You can hover over any of the tool tips that pop up to give you more context or explanation uh, or to give you the source for where to find that data for your own counties. And then you can change the numbers uh, and watch what happens to the potential savings at the bottom grow. So if we change this value to uh, 204,000 people, it goes up, we go back, oops, we go back, it goes there. You can reset any of the cells uh, if you want to, if you want to start over. Um, what else? Uh, you can uh, print this page and it'll print out a PDF of the report in case you want to bring it to uh, a meeting or, or show other people offline how it works. Uh, as I said, you can reset each of these cells. Um, you go to the sources page if you want to see where we pulled the data from. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, the math here is not all that complicated, really. The hardest part is finding the data from hospitals. Uh, so, right, hospitals are sometimes 
uh, not super interested in making public the data that they got. So uh, you may have to be a little bit creative in finding it, but there's some sources under the sources tab. And then if you're interested in diving deeper, you can go to this about page and there is a shortened link to the telehealth calculator that drives the whole website. And you can mess with any of the assumptions that we made for each of the variables. You can change them however you like, um, basically uh, whatever, whatever you wanna do. Uh, I ended up throwing together uh, a abbreviated version for Dallas County, Texas, and somebody can share the link to this Google Sheet as well, and you're welcome to take it and keep it as your own. Uh, but when we look at emergency department visits, lost productivity because of illness, uh, ad hospital admissions and readmissions, uh, and we just take the conservative numbers that we use to calculate uh, the value in this report, we're looking at just over $310 million in potential savings uh, in Dallas County uh, over a one year period. So that's what the telehealth report does and the telehealth calculator does. Uh, when we get to the Q&A session, I am of course, always happy to answer other questions. Pass it back over to Deanne. Thanks, Ryan. I am sharing the link to what Ryan just shared. <clears throat> so the, the you you can if there's other information that's not being pulled into that calculator resource, that's the information that you would add, Kelsey. If, if you wanted to add your own data, otherwise the the data the the window where he was toggling the data is where it, what's already included with the calculator. Right? Let me know if I'm jumbling this. That but. There, we've got data sets available with the calendar right now. That's what's built into the calculator. That's how it functions as a calculator. But if they wanted to overlay other data sets, they could do that. Is that correct? Sorry, yes, that's correct. Most So some of the data is, a, is available in scrapable formats, but building an online calculator where you just put in the title of your, your you know, the name of your county and state, uh, that's an infinitely more complicated task that is you know, was not a part of this particular project. So it does ask you to uh, to enter your own data, which is why we have the sources tab. And um, of course, my email is attached there. So if you're ever wanting to put together stuff for your county, uh, you can always shoot me an email. Great. All right, we are, um, we're going to throw up the question real quick before we stop recording. So today's group discussion, um, Jordan, next slide. Oh, there we go. We want to remind people to sign up for the Texas Broadband Development Office's newsletter. If you haven't already, I used a screen cap of dates. Um, as soon as I get it, I scroll down, I look at those dates. Um, again, pro tip, you know, if you're thinking about the 100 day challenge, a pretty good working group together, you know, putting these dates on a timeline for your projects um, projects as they come through the newsletter are going to be really helpful. So we're going to share with you um, a link of where you can sign up for the newsletter when you get the slides today or tomorrow. And next slide, here's just a gentle reminder of the digital opportunity email address, another link to where you can download and read the plan. And we now have expanded the office hours for two days at different times that are available, all central time. And here's my contact information and Rise contact information if you would like to reach out to us directly after today's session. And thank you so much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you next week.